Okay. Um, so hi everyone. I'm Jonathan Yuan. Um, my Chinese name is Yuan Chingyin actually, um, and I'm from Hong Kong. And uh, I am a human rights activist in Hong Kong, focusing on democracy building and also mass mobilizations. Um, so recently, I am so glad that I can join the momentum training and also learn a lot of concept. And we found that uh, the movement in 2014, which is called the Umbrella Movement, a uh, 79 days of um, sit-in and also civil disobedient occupation, has a lot of elements that we can use the momentum framework to apply on. So um, I'm so excited to know more from you two. And um, so today I'm going to talk about more of my experiences of organizing the umbrella movement. The umbrella movement happens in September 2014 and it ends in December 2014. But the Umbrella Movement was actually a, a continuity of a civil disobedience campaign that lasted for 15 months. So um, before we turn into the PowerPoint slides, I'm going to show you a video, which is seven minutes. Uh, the whole video is actually 75 minutes and it's well, uh, it's well done. So I highly recommend you, if you are interested of the Umbrella Movement, you can uh, just search People Power, Hong Kong Occupying Central, uh, produced by Al Jazeera. And uh, the, this 75 minutes of a documentary is worth to watch. But now we are just going to watch seven minutes of it. And uh, it is about uh, the time frame of this video is uh, before the outbreak of the um, Umbrella Movement. Okay. Oh my God! The second last night of the strike, and the students were out on a march. They were headed for Government House, home for CY Learn. They vowed to stay until the chief executive left for work the next morning. A small group of students managed to get to the front gate the next morning. But again, they received no response. September the 26th. Scholarism and a group of some 2,000 secondary school students joined the final day of the boycott. It was late in the evening when Joshua Wong sprang a surprise. The response was instantaneous. Civic Square was a popular protest spot that had recently been fenced off by the government. By storming it, the students were also drawing attention to what they saw as the government's increasingly unreasonable behaviour. Police quickly closed off the square and one was swiftly arrested. Outside the square, supporters started forming human walls in an attempt to stop more police from accessing the area. Across the road, a line of police tried to come through. Protesters surged forward, arms raised. It was then that someone opened an umbrella to defend himself in case the police used pepper spray. Others did the same. Similar scenes would occur in the days that followed. The umbrella soon became the symbol of the protest. At 
7 in the morning, police used pepper spray on a group of protesters. But it was clear, even at this early stage, that the students weren't backing down. As police secured one area, they quickly set up new blockades and new lines of defense. On the evening of the 27th of September, Occupy Central declared the start of their civil disobedience action. But even though the decision was supported by the student leaders, it didn't go down well with everyone. September the 28th. Although some protesters did leave the night before, many more were starting to arrive. News that police were restricting access to the protest site had caused outrage. Some people decided that they would block the roads surrounding the area instead. By late afternoon, the word had spread. Thousands of protesters had taken over some of downtown Hong Kong's most important roads. Police won't let them get in, right? Yes, that's why they occupy. If they let people use this space, this thing will not happen. So it is only because of our government. It's so coercive that have this result. The umbrellas were up. Police had started putting on gas masks. And then a surprising change of mind. But over on the main road facing the government complex, chaos as police fired tear gas on protesters. These were just the first of 87 rounds. Rather than drive people away, the tear gas had the opposite effect. Over the next few days, as many as 200,000 protesters filled the streets of downtown Hong Kong angered by what the police had done. Similar occupations also sprung up in other areas. October the 1st, five days after the storming of Civic Square, the student leaders who had triggered Hong Kong's biggest protests addressed the crowd. They were celebrated as heroes that night, even 
Lebanese authorities prepared a tougher response. No one just how difficult things would become. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, I'm going to stop the share and then I'm going to share my PowerPoint size. Okay, so before we start, uh, I know the umbrella movement is a uh, quite a messy and long period of uh, movement. So if you have any question, you can leave a comment in the chat box and we will explain and also clarify things if needed. Okay, so um, today we are going to talk about um, the umbrella movement, how organizations, how organizers uh, should respond to a more decentralized mass protest. Although during the uh, documentary, it says um, the outburst, the initial outburst, the storming into the government headquarters was sp sp uh, spontaneous. It's actually not. It was a uh, action that was designed that one hour before uh, the storming in into the government headquarters. And uh, the first groups of people who were charged in the um, government headquarters square was um, students of the uh, student associations. So you can say the trigger point of umbrella movement uh, was planned, although not well planned. Okay. So um, let's give an outline of today's module first. Uh, first, of, first of all, I will talk about some of the background information, like uh, the Hong Kong-China relationship, and also the goal of the Umbrella Movement, why there were so many people on the top of the street and protest for 79 days. Uh, and then I will talk more about the escalations part. Escalation means that uh, how uh, before the umbrella movement, we actually have a 15 months launch of uh, small actions and also a campaign that advocate for civil disobedient actions and also non-violence direct actions. So in those 15 months, what we have done that taught us and lead us to September 2014 and have so many people, 200,000 people talk the street. And for, thirdly, I will talk about um, as an organizers, what are reflections of a decentralized movement. Uh, the Umbrella Movement, as the first day, there were 200,000 people took the street. And as organizer, we didn't have so many organizers or uh, organizational member who can maintain order or try to control uh, the order of the occupying zone. And throughout the course, uh, there were a lot of autonomous actions initiated by the protesters and not need by the organizers. So how organizers can perceive themselves in a decentralized movement is worth to uh, take a look. So within the organizational role in decentralized movement module, I will explore the legitimacies of organizers, uh, what were our framing and also messaging to newcomers, and also how this uh, factor affect our options of tactics. And finally, uh, there might be some recommendations that everyone can learn to try to absorb the people who are being politicalized, which we are still struggling to try to absorb the people, even two years after the umbrella movement. So let's talk about the background first. Um, Hong Kong was a colony of UK, the uh, United Kingdom, for more than 150 years. Uh, since the 19th century, uh, that's 1890s, uh, the UK, they um, had a war with 
China at that time is called Qing Dynasty and um, Qing Dynasty News. So um, Hong Kong was seceded to uh, the uh, Britain. And after Second World War, there was, there was a wave of decolonizations. However, Hong Kong was not in the list of decolonization. It was not until 1980s uh, the UK and China start to discuss whether uh, Hong Kong should give it back to China. And in 1984, UK decided that Hong Kong should be returned to the People's Republic of China. But uh, Hong Kong is a piece of territory that are separated from Greater China for more than one century. So um, the, uh, the Britain and also Hong Kong people, they are uh, scare at the time that uh, if they are returned to China, their system, their social systems or political system uh, would not um, be consistent. And also there were a lot of worries about it. So the UK and Brit uh, and China, they designed this to have a special status imposed to Hong Kong. And Hong Kong is listed as the special administrative regions of the PLC. And we have our parallel political systems. Uh, the government, the government, uh, uh, we can rule, our, the Hong Kong people can rule our government. The Hong Kong, uh, and also we have our own pa parliament and also our social system. We even have a mini constitution called the Basic Law. And uh, this is important to know it because in the Basic Law, which is our mini constitution, there was one clause called Article 45, and it says the chief executive, which is the head of Hong Kong government, shall be elected by elections. And the ultimate aim uh, was to have a election that are universal suffrage, so free and fair elections. So to understand the 20 years democratic movement, uh, okay, so I saw a um, question during, and uh, okay, so it's about during British rule, were there instances of mass mobilizations or movement against colonial rule? Yes, there was. Uh, there was uh, several occasions that uh, people that of uh, urban uprisings, there were also uh, students who have the anti-imperialist uh, momentum and they have some street actions, but they are not as huge as the umbrella movement. Uh, in the 1980s, when the Britain decided to turn back Hong Kong to China, they start to have some degree of political reform. So they democratize uh, some parts of the parliaments of Hong Kong. And uh, at, at that time, Hong Kong is still um, a widely immigrant society. So people are not that politicalized as now. And it explains why there isn't a huge social movement against colonial rule in uh, the 1940s to 1990s. Uh, does it make sense? Okay. Um, okay. So back to um, back to the Article Forty Five. Forty Five. Um, to understand Hong Kong politics, or to or to understand Hong Kong democratic movement, was quite easy. Our twenty years of uh, democratic movement. Oh, by the way, uh, this year is the twentieth anniversary of uh, Hong Kong handover to the People's Republic of China. So, in our twenty years time of democratic uh, movement, we always struggling on this cause. That is, the uh, central government, the Chinese government, they wouldn't implement a full democracy. They wouldn't implement a universal suffrages in Hong Kong. And uh, so the goal of the democratic movement was to implement a free and fair electoral democracy. So in 1997, uh, Hong Kong was handed over from Britain to People's Republic of China. Uh, during 19, uh, between 1997 to 2012, there was a lot of things happened. There were a lot of social movement, but I will have to skip it because of the time. Anyway, in 2012, uh, CY Learn, which is the um, third term of, uh, which is the third head of government, chief executive, he came into office. And uh, since he came into office, the uh, political space, the civil, civil liberty space in Hong Kong is getting more narrow. 
So this lays down a foundation for uh, academics, this free initiator of Occupy and Central Movement uh, to propose a civil disobedience campaign. That is because they seen after uh, 15 years of democratic movement, the government was still not being able to implement a democracy in Hong Kong. And we try a lot of method and means like demonstrations or public processions to fight for democracy. And still the government wasn't uh, implemented. So they initiate the idea of the occupying Central with love and peace and start our 15 months of um, civil disobedience campaign and movement. That's the point when I was uh, joining uh, the Occupying Central uh, movement. I was a student leader at that time. I belonged to a student association called Federation of Students, which is an, an alliance of um, uh, Hong Kong universities. And uh, because the Occupying Central leader, they want to include as many civil society groups as they can. They include the student groups right after they initiate the movement. So the goals, I have already mentioned it, the goals of the umbrella movement and also the 20 years democratic movement we had in the past was to achieve a constitutional reform and also universal suffrages. Uh, it's not very progressive, it's just electoral, uh, electoral democracy. So uh, this is a politics 101 of uh, Hong Kong. And um, we have three layers of representations politics in Hong Kong. The, uh, this layer, is uh, local elections um, in uh, is equivalent to U.S. what elections? So the photo bank is about uh, ten thousand voters, uh, and then we have a parliamentary level. In parliamentary level, half of the seats are dro are divided geographically. They are called geographical constituency, and they are elected uh, free and fairly. Uh, What's troubling Hong Kong people and what's troubling Hong Kong democracy is the functional constituency. Basically, it's a uh, election. They had an election, but the elections was reserved to privileged the cars, to professionals, and uh, the eligibilities of uh, nominees, uh, the eligibilities of uh, candidates are uh, arbitrarily interpreted by the government. So most of the seat in here they are won by the pro government, pro Beijing side, because the general public cannot pass it a pay in it. And for the chief executive level, which is the head of government, the general public cannot pass it a pay it at all. It was reserved it to a 1200 uh, committee. And in this 1200 people committee, they have the rights to nominate, they have the rights to um, uh, nominate a candidate, and um, they also have the rights to vote um, for the next head of government. So for the head of government is chosen by uh, 1200 people only. The umbrella movement was targeting these two institutions, the chief executive level and the functional constituency in our parliament. What we were trying to achieve is to democratize it so that it can be free and fair for all. So uh, this is the end of the first module. Um, if no one have questions, I will go to the next module, which is escalation. Uh, how we do this 15 months long of um, civil disobedience campaign. So let's take a look of the movement ecologies first. Ecology first. Um, there is a going public anger um, this is where the stage that we are going to cover now, uh, how we use small actions and campaign propaganda media to try to grow public anger grievances so that they can participate in a certain point uh, to protest against the government. But then the ecology also have the peak, uh, which is, um, you can say, where when the police fired tear gas to the protester, it was the peak. And then there was the illusionment, which is uh, a kind of a dan sai or uh, the protester become calmed. Um, but now we are just going to focus the escalation part, the first phase. So before the Occupy Central movement was initiated, 
uh, I would say the leader, the free leader that you saw before, they were very clever. They have a clear strategic planning to, on how to perceive the movement. When they first proposed the ideas of uh, yeah, movement cycle. Yep, thank you. <laughs> thank you for clarifying. Okay, so um, when the leader, they trying to uh, design the uh, Occupy Central Movement, they have a clear strategic plan. And uh, although they advocate for civil disobedient action, although they advocate for occupations, the main idea in the Occupy Central Movement wasn't occupy, but love and peace. Uh, the, the reasons for advocating love and peace is because they want to, um, uh, okay, uh, by the way, uh, I would like to thank Movement Net, uh, Net for uh, the graph that we saw uh, here. Um, okay, so for the Occupy Central Movement, um, they focus on love and peace. And the reason they do so is because Hong Kong doesn't have a massive, huge scales of civil disobedience tradition. Uh, unlike US, US have civil disobedience direct action since the 60s or even earlier, but we doesn't have that large scales of uh, civil disobedience actions. So people doesn't really know what civil disobedience looks like. Uh, they fear about it. They fear it might bring chaos, which is what the government advocated and try to demonize us. So they have to use the framing of peace and love so that people will feel that, oh, this is more calmed. Uh, this is also more spiritual. So a lot of time when the Occupy and Central Movement, they have a press conference, they will organize a press conference in a church, uh, which is more spiritual, it is more religious, and it makes people feel like, oh, they are peaceful lover, they're peace lover. And also another framing is they uh, emphasize the movement, the uh, proposal of um, civil disobedient actions was uh, done by a reflective and deliberative actions. So before the um, occupying, before any civil disobedient action, they the leaders of Occupy Central Movement, they have free deliberation day. This deliberation day, people will join together in uh, 15 or 20 people in a group, and they will discuss about what's their visions of democracy, what their visions of civil disobedience, what uh, amounts to violences in a group discussions. And after those group discussions, um, their opinions will be given to the secretary of Occupy and Central Movement so that it can, the people's opinion can be diverted to the Occupy and Central Movement itself. And it gives people a feeling that, oh, these people are rational. They are not uh, initiating a civil disobedience uh, out of emotions. And lastly, uh, they said uh, the Occupy and Central emphasized that civil disobedience and direct actions will be initiated if necessary. So uh, they are, the original spirit of uh, Occupy and Central movement wasn't to create a civil disobedience action only. There were a lot of, um, you can say, leeway for the movement leader to try to negotiate, try to, to interact, and also um, trying to push pressure to the government. And if the government doesn't uh, implement democracy at all, only then civil disobedience direct action will be launched. And uh, so these are the major front loading of the movement DNA. And the instrument to carry out this front loading DNA is by a um, several instruments. One of them is called the letter of intent. Um, the letter of intent is basically a contract. So for people who uh, participate the deliberation day or who identify themselves as a core member of Occupy and Central Movement, they will have to sign an uh, agreement and saying that they will not initiate balances. And it gives a sense that, oh, these people who are joining the movement are rational being uh, instead of emotional being. 
uh, I saw questions and said, did this refractive assembly take place before the first? Yes, uh, this refractive assembly was take token place before any kind of civil obedient actions. Uh, there were three of them uh, in nine in eight months, and um, all together in all this free deliberation day, there were three thousand people participate in it. So it's not a huge number, but it's um, well, you can say it's one of the kind too in Hong Kong history because we never done it. We never have such a uh, group discussions culture in Hong Kong that uh, people will sit together for five hours and try to discuss civil disobedience. So going back to the instruments, other than letter of intent, uh, there are also a manual. So this book is written by the um, founder of Occupy Central Movement. The Occupy Central Movement was launched in um, March. 2013 and this book is published within six months so you can see in this book it talks about a lot about the principles of civil disobedience the see the spirit of civil dis disobedience and the pauses of civil disobedience so it's very transparent and it gives a sense again for the people for the general public that this is a well planned this is not chaos uh, other than books and manual we also have training and I feel training is very important for us for, uh, to try to promote a civil disobedient action because we present a peaceful minded uh, train, uh, action, a uh, stimulation of um, civil disobedience to the general public. And when the general public, they saw it on TV, on social media, seeing that, oh, these people are actually smiling when they are doing civil disobedience, uh, they will feel like, again, this is not chaos. Um, so we have uh, extensive training, but those training are not very well well, uh, well spread. I would say uh, about 200 or 300 people have directly uh, participated in this training. Oh, this is what water cannon training. And uh, whenever we have this training, we always use multimedia. We all use mass me media to report on us. So people know what would a civil disobedience look like. And lastly, this one is very important again, uh, is by using network of escalation, by spreading out trainers to different civil society groups to advocate and promote the idea of civil disobedience. And this is the, uh, this one I will explain it now. So you can see this is a, uh, this is a timeline for the whole 15 months launch of campaign. And then I'm going to show you how the Occupy Central Movement spread its DNA and how they are going to escalate. Actually, within the capacity of uh, Occupy Central Movement, the first year, March 2013 to May 2013, there isn't much small actions initiated or uh, uh, escalations. Most of the time, they use media to try to advocate and promote their idea. They use educations, they make videos, they make books, they make a lot of talk uh, um, to try to convince people that civil disobedience is one way to fight for democracy. And of course, they do have a deliberation day. So you can see there isn't much uh, escalation in here. It's quite flat. Not until in June 2014, when the Occupy Central Movement initiated an electronic referendum uh, that um, there were uh, 800,000 people participate the electronic referendum and vote for an electoral uh, reform package that they like. And in August, there... In August, they, they start to have the first Occupy Central Movement, like this capacity, they start their very first demonstrations. So you can see at the first 13 months, there isn't any street demonstration or small action initiated by Occupy Central Movement, not until August 2014. But then, other than the Occupy Central Movement, there are other civil society groups who work closely together with the Occupy, uh, with the OCLP. Um, so, two examples, which happened, uh, I was in uh, HKFS, the Hong Kong Federation of Students, but I, 
I was also one of the spokesman of the Civil Human Rights Fund. These two groups, we work together with uh, Occupy Central Movement along with other groups. Uh, so although the Occupy Central Movement, they didn't initiate much small actions in the first year, the other groups, they do. So look at the green line in here. We actually have a big march uh, in um, the first year. We have a lot of small actions. Uh, we have some direct actions who target uh, um, government officials. And we also initiate a class boycott in uh, September. And we have a civil disobedient action that are not using uh, the capacity of occupying central movement, but ourselves uh, to try to escalate the situations. And this is what we call a network that's escalations. The OCLP are at the center. They are like a spiritual guidance to other civil society groups. And surrounding the OCLP, we, there are religious groups we work together. There are political parties work together. There are civil society groups, student groups who work along with uh, Occupy and Central Movement. And Occupy and Central Movement are like the brain of a body. They provide ideas, they provide guidance, they provide directions, they provide uh, principles for nonviolent actions. So one DNA they spread is of course nonviolent spirits. So for groups, for leaders of these groups, they usually participate training of the OCLP. So they understand nonviolent spirits and they use it to try to promote it to their own audience. And um, also there is also uh, one DNA that is a direct actions. So uh, for this group, we advocate the necessities of direct actions to our own audience. Uh, and finally, we also trying to advocate a gender democracy that we try to frame democ gender uh, democracy as our only goal. So you can say um, with all these three elements, this free wealth idea, it formed the DNA of the Occupy Central Movement spirit of civil disobedient actions. So one example uh, of applying the concept of Occupy and Central Movement was the organization I was in, Civil Human Rights Fund. Civil Human Rights Fund was focusing on democracy building and also mass mobilizations. So in 2013, July, 1st of, uh, 1st of July ready, four months after the idea of Occupy and Central Movement was uh, proposed, we already used the idea of Occupy and Central. We use these slogans as our topic of the uh, rally. So the topic of the rally was Occupy and Central, we are in positions. So from the first four months, we already advocate a, a sense of momentum that civil disobedience is going to happen and people need to be prepared for that. So for uh, six months later after this rally, there was another rally in 2014. Uh, beside advocating the idea of Occupy and Central Movement, this time in January, we actually have a non-violence direct action training on the stage, on the assembly we organized during the rally. So the participants of the rally, although they're not participating in a civil disobedient action yet, they know how it would be look like because we have we demonstrate a training to them. And this gives them a rough idea of uh, nonviolent direct actions. And finally, in July, there's another escalation. This time, we have a real civil disobedient actions. So one year after the uh, 2013 uh, 1st of July rally, we actually initiated a small scale of civil disobedience sit-in uh, that 511 people, they were sitting, they were occupying one road in our financial center. And we spent a night in there when the police are arresting people one by one. So finally, there were 550, uh, 511 people arrested. And when the general public, they saw how protesters are, uh, so pe the, how peaceful was the post protester and the sacrifice of the students during this small scales of civil disobedience in they are more confident and convinced that the 
a civil disobedient action would not need to any chaos, but at the opposite is a sense of self-sacrificing, uh, and also it is efficient in creating disruption, despite it only disrupt uh, the traffic for one night only. So after this, the government can no longer demonize the Occupy Central Movement or civil disobedient actions. And that's how we convince more people to join our cause. So um, before turning into the next module, I will say there are several formula of our escalations. Uh, the civil disobedient action, as I said, we didn't have these transitions. And by proposing this idea, it was an eye-catching new bold ideas that attract almost all political groups or civil society groups. So everyone wants to play a role in it because this is new and uh, it has a lot of potentials. And when people see the potential, they will be more likely to join in. That's how we spread the DNAs of the escalation. That's how we uh, organize the ideas of civil disobedience through the network of civil society. And then for escalation, of course, we are increasing it throughout the timeline. We are increasingly uh, disruptive. We are increasingly self-sacrificing. And it makes uh, the moral appeal to the general public greater. Thirdly, um, although uh, the whole idea of uh, civil disobedience was similar amongst the network of civil society groups. When the civil society groups trying to promote the idea of uh, and also actions, they are actually tailor-made uh, to their own audience. So for women, uh, for women's groups, they use the discourse of how women can participate democracy movement. Uh, in student groups, we will talk more about uh, the struggles of being a youth in our society and only civil disobedient action can help us to overcome the struggles. So it is a tailor-made discourse uh, between uh, the network of civil society groups. And also, uh, I think this one is also very important that we extensively use multimedia and uh, we are very attention seeking in mass media. So every time when we have training, we we'll invite a lot of journalists. We maintain a good relationship with uh, media too, so that they will report what we have done. And uh, this makes the Occupy, the idea of Occupy uh, has been uh, trending on mass media for uh, quite a long period. And uh, it kind of convinced people that this idea is actually working. Lastly, uh, there was a coordinated radical flank, and I think this is the most important part. So looking back to the timeline, the Federation of Students or the Civil Human Rights Fund are actually radical flank compared to the Occupy Central Movement. And uh, the reason we are doing so many small actions or escalation it's because we understand the Occupy Central Movement capacity could not handle so much challenge from the general public. So by having these other civil groups to launch small action that are consistent with um, civil disobedience, we are actually experimenting. We are actually testing the water. We are testing the, accept, uh, the acceptances of the general public. And if things went wrong, it goes the backfire will go to uh, student groups or other civil society group groups, but it will not go to the uh, Occupy Central Movement, which on one hand, help the escalation, but on the other, it avoids uh, mistakes and uh, it avoids uh, inconfident to the whole Occupy Central Movement. Um, so lastly, uh, as you see in the video, uh, we have all this uh, escalation that leads us to the trigger point, which is September 2014, when the students had their uh, student strikes. They, uh, at one night, they stormed into the government headquarters, which triggered uh, a backfire from the police. The police responded uh, very brutally, 
and uh, a lot of innocent uh, students were dragged on the ground by the police violently. These images has been replayed on mass media for two days, for two days. So it creates a lot of grievances among the general public. And also it creates a moral obligation for the general public because innocent students need the protections of adults. And finally, because um, the student groups and other civil society groups, they uh, call out actions, call out power for the general public. It creates an urgency for the general public to join the movement, not just watch the movement. And all these three uh, elements join together, it turns the trigger bomb into a one wind moment. So to recap, Occupy Central Movement at first, and then small uh, action escalation, uh, trigger point, and then uh, backfire, and uh, the police was uh, firing a tear gas at the general public. And finally, because people were so angry about the actions of police, they autonomously occupy uh, the street. Even the organization didn't tell them to do so. Okay, so this is the second part of the module. I see there is a question. Uh, let me take a look. If you have any question, you can raise it now too. Okay. okay. So uh, because Hong Kong is generally a free society, even now, uh, Raising the idea of civil disobedience doesn't amount to any legal risk. Of course, the government was trying to do so, but uh, there's nothing in our legal instruments that can go against the leaderships of the OCLP. And, um, and the, OC, the OCLP wrote uh, in uh, the, uh, for, you can say the first year, yes, it is more on propaganda and education but they also initiate the deliberation day, which they gathered uh, the opinions of the participants. They organize some training for core member. Uh, they organize a structure for the Occupy Central Movement. So for the Occupy Central Movement, there were actually several team, you can say. One of them is medical team. The other one is the legal assistant team that they organize some lawyer to um, try to help the arrestor if people are get, getting arrested. There were also a marshal team. This marshal are functioning as this, the escalator and also monitoring, monitor of police action. Uh, there were also uh, even facilitator, you can say social worker, and their world is to trying to accommodate mental, uh, the, men, the mental sides of the people. And finally, there was a secretary and also media team who uh, responsible to digest the information and also news um, in the media and trying to respond it properly. So you can say they like the, for the OCLP, they are like the brain. They are the generator of discourse while um, the other civil society groups, they help to promote the actions, they help to organize more people, they help as a grand soldiers of Occupy and Central Movement. Does it make sense? Okay, I don't see uh, any other questions. So right now we're going to the third module, which is as an organizer, we witness a lot of uh, difficulty and also obstacle when we have this decentralized massive movement and uh, what were the factor, what were the obstacle, and uh, what were the reflections. That's what we are going to talk about. So you can say traditionally we will divide uh, social movement into, you can say, two types. One, one type is uh, structure movement. That is like the civil rights movement. We have a uh, coherent, we have a, a strong organization and the organization, they will include some members. The members will be... Uh, helping to try to organize even more people to uh, talk the, take the street or take uh, uh, direct actions. Uh, in umbrella movement case, it, on one hand, it is structure because there is an OCLP structure in here and there were a lot of hierarchy in here. But at the same time, not every participant uh, identifying themselves as a member of the OCLP. So there are different networks 
that the OCIP are trying to include it, like the political party, like the student groups, like the civil society groups. And for participants of uh, these student groups or political parties, those practice participants are not necessarily members of these groups too, but they might be the supporter uh, of these groups which are included into the cause of umbrella movement. So you can say the umbrella movement is a structural based network movement. It's a hybrid model that try the uh, originally the OCLP was trying to include these groups and uh, by using the reputations of these groups they can even include more supporters or a passive uh, supporter to become an active supporter of the movement. However, what we witness in reality is the umbrella movement is increasingly become a self-realization decentralized movement. Uh, at least this is what happened two weeks after the uh, trigger point of the movement. So there were more people who doesn't identify themselves as a as affiliating any groups and who doesn't who also not identify the needs of having a leader so this is a survey done in the uh, second month of the umbrella movement that some scholars they do a survey to a uh, protester who are uh, living in the occupying zone or just walking in the occupying zone 56 percent of them identify the movement leader as the Hong Kong Federation of Students 29 percent of them identify scholars which is another student groups but the high school student groups as the leader and it makes sense because it was the students who launched and stormed into the uh, government headquarters that's why more people identify themselves identify these groups as leader and interestingly the original proposal of civil disobedience action OCLP they only have 17.7 percent of popularity even more interestingly there were more than 30 percent close to 35 percent of people who think the movement doesn't need any leader and this is a huge portion you can say and uh, i think even in u.s context there are increasingly um people who think a movement doesn't need a leader so which leads uh, which leads to a problem what makes these people feel uh, leader are uh, unnecessary for a uh, decentralized movement. One of the factors is, of course, uh, in our survey, we found that more than 50% of the protesters joined the movement only after the trigger point. So before that, they were actually not affiliated with any civil society groups. They are not even hearing or understanding the, the spirit of Occupying Central Movement. They came because they saw the tear gas, they came because they saw the students was violently treated by the police. And you can see this is a pyramid. Uh, you can also say this is a DNA of uh, or characteristics of the umbrella movement, the major framing of the uh, umbrella movement. So at the first layer, this is widely accepted by the people. Uh, we always heard people shouting out this slogan, which is master of our destiny. It means that no one can represent you, only the people can represent themselves. And uh, this is another layer of the framing. Hope relies on people. Change starts with resistance. People know that they can only rely on themselves. And resistance is the only mode and only method that you can achieve victory in the umbrella movement. So most of the people, they stop at this layer. However, it was this two layer that guide the behavior of these two framing. So as the deliberative uh, spirit in the Occupy Central Movement, to have a disciplines of organization in this uh, Occupy Movement, to have a love and peace spirit, communicative spirit within the movement. And without these two guiding principles being transmitted to the people, it actually, this un incomplete of DNA, it changed people behavior and it changed people perceptions of the movement. So you can say originally, we hope all this can be transmitted to every protester uh, in the movement. This is an ideal case. The reality, we can only transmit this part. So 
everything change. The consequences of change uh, incomplete DNA. So you can see this is a cycle of momentum. We have a escalation, we have a trigger point. But then without transmitting a full DNA to the protester, there are legitimacy crises and also internal rivalry, even within the protester. There were uh, general mistrucks among the protester. And without legitimacy of the leader or organizer, it limit, the consequences is it limits our options of tactics. So I'm going to talk more about what makes it difficult to transmit the DNA, full DNA to the protester. One of the factors is we have a decentralized ownership. So look at this map. This is a Hong Kong map, not a complete one. Uh, but you can see the wet dot. The wet dot is where people occupy uh, roads and streets. Uh, what you see, the tear gas was in here. The government headquarters is in here. Uh, the organizer headquarters is also in here. But then there are a lot of people who are actually occupying places in here and here. And by having a scattered location, uh, they don't get to see the leader much. And the leader doesn't have a lot of time because they have to digest a lot of information even in this area. And uh, there is a gap between the protester in here and here and in here. And when the people have different, uh, are located in different locations, they have different perceptions of what movement looks like. So having a different experiences, they have different perceptions of the movement. If they have different perception, they will have different preference to tactics and also strategy. And finally, there is also a lack of organizer participant communication tool. Uh, you can say uh, the communications between protesters and the organizer is, uh, is one way that only organizers is uh, trying to present their speech to the organizer uh, to the protester while the opinions of the protester cannot divert to the organizer which makes it uh so when the organizers and also the protester they are they have gap they have uh they are broken up with each other the protesters started to have their own ownership of the movement so you can see in here this is the government headquarters part Part. What the organizer usually um, sitting in is the government headquarters part, uh, the legislative council part. But then there is a lot of uh, barriers set by the protesters themselves. There is also some surprisations. I'm going to show you what barriers looks like. This is like barriers. It is for uh, to defend the occupying zone to defend from uh, police and also mafia attack. This is what supply station looks like. It wasn't run by the organizer. We, um, the supply stations has no affiliation with organizers. And uh, it was, uh, the supplies was bring by the protester themselves. The distributions of supplies are also done by volunteers themselves. And uh, it's cr quite hard uh, for the organizers to tell this, uh, the owners of this barriers or the surprise station to do uh, because we have no connection with each other. So this is what I'm saying that there are a lot of decentralized ownerships of the movement. The other factor of having a uh, mistrust to the leadership is we had a warm framing and I hope that everyone can learn a lesson from that. Uh, originally, we want to maintain a nonviolent discipline. And the way we're trying to um, tell people to maintain nonviolence discipline is by telling people there might be infiltration from the police. And so we said to the people that, oh, there might be infiltrate. If someone provoke violence, they might be sent by the police. So people were quite in a high alert. And they uh, were in a high alert in a sense that they become suspicious to everything. <laughs> So one of the example was on one day I saw a person who was walking on the occupy, in the occupying zone uh, and all of a sudden he was accused by another protester and the protester asked him, are you a police officer? And the person who had been accused said, no, I'm not. 
And then he was asked to prove he wasn't a police officer. It's very hard to do so because if you're not something, it's hard to prove you are not, right? So two minutes later, there were 30 people surrounding him, asking him to prove he is not a police officer. That's how deep is the suspicions among the protesters. Gradually, the Marshall team, which should be a, uh, um, you can say, a contact point between organizers and the protester, are also being suspicious by the protester. So the marshal lost their credibility. There were a lot of uh, suspicious to any form of uh, uh, retreat. So you can see these three people are actually, uh, you can say some of the organizer of the Occupy Central Movement. And there was a lot of wit pacings and also poster saying that, oh, you should beware of these people. Uh, I think no one knows this word, NEFTA, uh, it's actually describing uh, leftists, but uh, in a negative way. Uh, it describes the leftists as uh, Rita, so uh, altogether leftist. Um, so there are a lot of suspicions saying that, oh, so you shouldn't hear uh, if someone tell you to uh, move your barriers, if someone uh, trying to communicate with you on organizing, they might be sent by the police, they may be spied. Um, okay. Let's see. Okay. So when the marshal lose their credibility, there are increasing suspicion even to the leaderships itself. And gradually, the only consensus that every protester can have is to continue occupations, and it limit the options of tactics because no one can agree on anything else. Um, so another, so when we have this decentralized ownerships of movement, we the organizer encounter a crisis of legitimacies. Uh, social movement should be voluntary, uh, but then the organizer also encounter a lot of legitimacy crisis. When the newcomers, they came to the movement, they were not affiliated with any leader. So what we're trying to do at the beginning was to try to include even more civil society groups that we hope the reputations of these civil society groups can convince people that we are actually representing the people. But we have failed to do so because most of the newcomers, they're not available with any organizations. Gradually, they developed a alternative tactics. There were a lot of opinions of how the movement should go on. So our organizational response is by open mic. Uh, every night at 6 p.m., we will open mic in a stage and have people to talk about their opinions, their visions of the movement. And again, um, it works for a certain degree. Some of the grievances, some of the opinions was reflected. So there weren't, uh, some challenges was dis dismissed it. But then we, uh, we were too late to open up our might. People have already developed even more ownership to the movement that they reject any forms of leadership within the movement. So lastly, what we're trying to do was to have an on-site voting. We're trying to have an on-site referendum so that people can actually decide the course of the movement. But then there were a lot of arguments saying that who can vote, uh, who are eligible, to design the course of the movement. If someone who only occupy uh, 10, 10 days on the street, should they be voting? Uh, will there be infiltration that are trying to dismiss the movement? There were so many suspicion that makes this on-site voting cannot uh, run eventually. So another consequences of having this decentralized momentum is we were unable to have a lot of options on our tactics. You can see a incomplete DNA transmission and also legitimacy crisis. It would limit the feasibility of um, momentum movement. And I, I will see this is one of the biggest obstacle for uh, decentralized this movement uh, for organizer. We try several way to uh, shift our tactics from just occupations to another level. 
So there were actually one negotiation between the student groups and the government uh, officials, one uh, first time in our history. But because the movement DNA was sticked to resistance and not being able to compromise anything, um, it's hard to use negotiations as one way to shift our tactics. And also the government didn't promise anything. So it's hard to uh, tell people that it's time to move on without any uh, progress from the government. And then we're trying to do more canvassing uh, in a different community. So uh, the leadership, they trying to tell the people that uh, we should uh, not just sitting or sleeping in our occupying zone. We should engage with the general public. But again, because the occupation is still happening, there were a lot of threat of be a police repressions. People were reluctant to leave the occupying zone and go to another area just to do a promotions. Um, so lastly, one method we try is to buy a common people to escalate. We had a final escalation in the second month in, in the last day of uh, November that we trying to add, uh, motivate people to blockade and uh, surround the government headquarters. Uh, but the police at that time, they were very strong. Uh, within one night, there were more than 1,000 injuries. And uh, we are still paying the cost uh, for so many people being injured. So this is what this is a um, kind of you can say an outline of uh, the difficulty of the movement when the movement dna could not be spread uh, comprehensively to every newcomer it's actually hard to uh to trying to have a consistent behavior for protester and if we doesn't have a uh, a consistent behavior there will be also a legitimacy crisis of the uh, leader. So in a normal cycle of um, momentum, we do have an escalation and then we gain active support and then we will declare victory. But when we have a incomplete DNA and when we have a legitimacy crisis, no one can actually frame victory. No one has the capacity or no one has the reputation, has the legitimacy to try to conclude the movement and have the movement to go on. And right now we are, that, we are kind of uh, stuck in this stage. Because the leader were the organizer were having a legitimacy crisis, there were a lot of fashions. There were a lot of mistrust to uh, any kinds of organizations. Uh, and have, having so much suspicions to organization, people are not being able to absorb to a larger movement so that this cycle would not be able to proceed to another stage of escalations. Uh, it's been two and a half year already. Uh, still pe a lot of people are reluctant to join mass protests. And uh, what we are trying to do now is to convince that people mass protest is still working and uh, the umbrella movement is still uh, gaining us some victory. Uh, but this is a long process that we are trying to do it. Um, so this is the last, you can say the last slide of um, our presentation. I think one way we can try, uh, we have to be, uh, aware is it's not always uh it's this cycle is not necessarily going to uh, go on you have to be aware how you spread the movement dna you have to be aware how you frame the your victory and one way i think we can try to explore is by having an absorption, not after the movement, but during the uh, episodes of contentions. So this is what momentum movement looks like. It is, is a, um, a decentralized structure that we hope different network can train up trainer and this trainer can spread the messages and also spread the movement DNA to other participants. 
But when we have a contention that all this newcomer had not received any training, had not been affiliated with any trainer or uh, organization, I think this trainer or network should act as a messenger or booker or facilitator to try to connect with these people. What we observe during the umbrella movement is people doesn't object leaders uh, lead movement entirely. There are a lot of small circles formed during the movement. Say, this is like a supply station. This is like a barrier leader. And by having movement organizer to engage with this leader of a small circle, I believe we can engage with them. We can try to include them into a greater movement that there won't be a lot of factions. And I think besides having a message as a facilitator, we should also establish a grievances and dialogue mechanism between the newcomers or ordinary protesters. So, for example, we need to open mic as soon as possible for the protesters who have opinions to uh, the movement. In Tunisia cases, there were a dialogue mechanisms for seven years before the adjustment revolutions. So there were a lot of small groups, a lot of uh, resistant groups are being included in a informal dialogue mechanism. And having this dialogue mechanism, um, they were able to work together even there was a episode of contentions because they established some relationships. So I will stop in here uh, my end word, ending quote will be, uh, it's always good to have a rainbow, uh, but then don't let it blow away organizer, let it blow away the government, but not letting it blow away uh, you. Thank you. Okay, so um, right now I will take uh, questions. I actually have to run, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, this was extremely, extremely interesting, Johnson. And uh, I will have many questions, but I need mm -hmm. to process everything and to think about everything that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so just thank you for taking the time of doing this. Thank you, CCF, for organizing this super, super informative. And um, uh, I, I'm going to send you an email, Johnson, so, uh, so maybe we can meet up in this year. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We should do that. All right. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Bye. Well, it was very interesting mm -hmm. and helpful for, for me, um, having had very little experience in this kind of organizing. Uh, I've been working in a more traditional kind of organizing. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what it brought out for me, as I'm an Episcopal priest. Mm -hmm. um, what I saw in the breakdown of the function of the movement was similar to what I see as the breakdown in the function of the larger church. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, some of the similar causes of that. Um, from my perspective, the church has very little impact because we don't work together mm. and because we are fragmented. Um, and some of the things that you talked about were similar to what I think is causing that within the, within the church. But anyway, that's just because I look, look at this through the lens of a pastor. <laughs> uh, but it was very helpful mm. to hear the story. Um, and it, it will help me imagine, because uh, we are trying to do community organizing and collaborating with other churches to try to address issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and it will mm -hmm. be helpful with that. And can you talk more about, okay, like, right. so, thank you. And so it's about, is, is it because the fragmentation, is it because of geographical differences? 
or different interpretations of the religion? I think it's because um, it's fragmentation because everyone.